Hey everybody, my name is Daryl Akins of the Anglers All Crew. We are hanging out in the fly studio, tying up a carp bug. Today, Egan's headstand. This is a wildly popular carp fly. And uh, we're gonna tie it on a 2457 in a size eight. We're gonna untangle our thread from our bobbin. We're gonna use Uni in a six shot, 136 denier. Wha-bang, for the eyes. And uh, I will be changing to a 30, I'm sorry, a 50 denier a GSP for the body. So we'll, I'll do the head with uh, the Uni and then we'll change up. All right, so we're gonna start our eyes, or our thread just behind the hook eye here. I'm not gonna address the whole hook. I'm just gonna go ahead and, uh, and address the front end right now. We'll, we'll go to the back when we need to. Uh, I've said this before in a few of my videos. If we just take this set of, of eyes and, and set them onto the hook shank, these medium bead chain eyes, the really, really, really skinny bar in the middle is gonna have to go lie on perpendicular to this, this, this skinny hook shank. And they're just, it's not the best way to kind of start that relationship, so to speak. So if we add some girth to this hook shank here with a handful of wraps back and forth, what we do now is we've just literally added um, something that's both grippy thread and girthy thread. <laughs> and that's gonna allow these bead chain eyes to grab that way, way easier. And then subsequently, our good to technique to grab, keep things going. So there's a really good thing here I'm gonna show you now. So because of the way this fly finishes up, we're gonna wanna make sure that we leave enough room in the front to not only wrap some dubbing around these eyes and build the head, but to make sure that we have enough space to whip so we don't crowd our head. So I do put these eyes, a full eye, uh, hook eye in, to allow for that space when we finish up with the fly. So same kind of uh, system that I use with my eyes. I'm a series of X wraps back and forth, inline tightening, so I, can, I really get a good cinch and good technique on these eyes. And if I wanna move my eyes, I do so with thread wraps and support versus using my hands or fingers to move those eyes. I will wrench them back and forth uh, with X wraps in one way, one direction or the other. Uh, in between those X wraps, I do the over the shank, under the eyes a few times clockwise, and then counterclockwise, and then inline cinches, and then tie those off. And I do a few, like a series of those. And what we do now is we have super good technique binding these both ways, both directions from, from the inside and the top, uh, as well as using the proper adhesives which is next. So this is gonna be the Loon Soft Head, or I'm sorry, Loon Water-Based Glue. And the Loon Water-Based Glue is just a, a magic adhesive, in my opinion, for carp flies, because it allows us to add an adhesive that works with us and not against us. So I like to add this adhesive halfway through the eye build or the head build. And the reason being is that I wanna make sure that when I do apply the Loon uh, water-based glue that it soaks down and gets the bar of the medium B chains and the thread that we based or uh, put down on the hook shank. Once that goes down and I can see that kind of soaked in, then I kind of fit, finish up and absorb what's left over with the dry thread wraps on top when I finish the head. Um, I want to make sure that my eyes are straight here, so I'm going to go ahead and turn them over and give my eyes a different perspective. And I can already look at these and tell that they're a little cattywampus. I can look at those and tell that my I'm sitting at about five to 12, five minutes to noon. So in order to get these eyes back, I don't wanna just move them and cinch them down because all of those tight wraps that I put in, all compromise to move because they're gonna loosen as I tighten those. So what I wanna do is do an X wrap and cinch in and do some wrenching with actual thread and get those where I want them. And now with them being straight, I did that with thread tension versus kind of moving them and I can minimize how much we're gonna loosen thread that way. So once I'm happy with the eyes, I'm gonna go ahead and, and half hitch my uni. And again, keep on going and if you wanna rock it, you can rock some uni. I do like having a thread with a smaller diameter and more strength, uh, in particular with a carp fly, because this, this is gonna allow me to be uh, more in control of how much material is going on the hook shank. So we're gonna lay a thread base here, right to the hook bend, and we're gonna have a few things working in our favor for this to turn over. Um, the first is the hook, just from an engineered point of view, is a down eye. If you kind of look at the 2457, it already has a down eye, so this is gonna allow us to kind of have 
engineering within the hook work in our favor and that it's gonna wanna already roll over. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna essentially, with our tail, tie in another down eye on the back of the hook shank. And what we're gonna do is what is called either tail creep or tail drag. Uh, I'm gonna cut off about an inch of rabbit here. And I'm gonna be upfront here, I love bushy tails on carp flies, whether it's marabou, whether it's rabbit, whether it's Australian possum. So basically I took that one inch and I kinda just got to the position where I can kinda get it manageable in my hand. Now, I still have everything I cut there. What we're gonna wanna do is before you get too uh, proactive in, 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 in trimming this down to size, keep all of the, sh the, the length of that because what we can do now is we can prevent having a material bump back here where we have the, the, the acute cutoff. Uh, and then we also allow ourselves to kind of tie in a little bit of a taper as well. So go ahead and we're gonna, again, old trout tail trick. We're gonna go ahead and measure this tail out to the length of the body, grab it, and then we're gonna pinch wrap right on the hook bend. So you can see where my thread is here, right? I'm right on that bend. Essentially make, making sure that we're right even with the, the down eye in the front, so the tail drag in the back is gonna act as a down eye in the back. So if the down eye in the front helps us turn the hook over, a down eye in the back is really gonna reinforce that. And I'm gonna go ahead and pinch wrap. I'm gonna grab that with my forefinger and my thumb, right? And it's kind of hanging out now, right in my foot, and I'm gonna come all the way around where I want that and I can then cinch that down and have that in place without it moving the position of the thread. So, tried and true move. I love the double cinch underneath, man. It's all about durability. So before tying the rest of this in, I have my cinches over the top of the rabbit. I have my cinches underneath the rabbit. Having those two underneath like that really grabs that material and makes sure that it's not gonna move back and forth this way on the hook shank. And that's really what's important. Once we tie it down, we don't want our tail spinning. Uh, once we start catching fish. So we wanna minimize the bulk of the rabbit. Um, at the same time, we wanna make sure that we don't have the material bump back there and we kinda work in a taper. So we're gonna do a cut that's just gonna kinda work in our favor that way, right? We've all seen and done that bad boy before. I'm not recreating the wheel. And what that's gonna do now is allow us to avoid the material bump there. If I cut this off right there, I have to kinda work with this bump. And it's just, you know, it's not pretty to the eye or the good engineering that Lance put into this. So I'm doing this backwards, I know what you're thinking. What are you doing? We tied it in back there. We tied it in back there. This is my way mentally of thinking about, you know, like um, for this to come out, both ends have to independently somehow come out apart from each other without the middle happening. So like the whole middle of this fly has to get destroyed for either of these to fail now. So that's just kind of like having two guys in a submarine and they both have to turn the key to launch the missile. For all of that to go wrong and come undone now, so we're just kind of over-engineering and making sure that we put in little tiny tweaks to the tie to improve the durability of this. So just by tying these in at different points in different ways um, allows this to where if this happens for some reason to come undone, it's not gonna because this is tied in back over it. So now that I've already cinched the front and that's gonna be our taper going back, I'm just gonna follow that back. I'm gonna use my finger to make sure that my thread tension does not roll that rabbit over the side of the hook shank for me. And I just did some pretty loose spiral wraps to kind of get where I want to get. Now that I'm there, I'm gonna go back with really, really nice, secure thread wraps and make sure that we build our body up. And you can see how nice and even we have our body. So our tail's tied in. All we're gonna do now is finish the body. I think that we do a little hackle feather next. A little rooster hackle, ginger, rust, something along those lines. I'm gonna get us right shy of the tail and then we're gonna prepare our feather. So what I'm looking to do here is tie this in facing this way so when we do tie, we get the color facing the front of our fly. And I like to tie in on the side hook shank with a little bit of space on that feather. I don't wanna tie the barbels of that feather all the way to the butt of the shank because what's gonna happen is the hackle feathers are gonna get in the way and not lay flat. So by allowing a little bit of space for that feather to kind of lay down and have some room to kind of spread out as we wrap is gonna improve this laying down clean for us. So we've got our feather wrapped in, our hackle feather, our tails in. We're gonna dub our body. It's gonna be a rust antron. And this is not one of those really, really super felt flies where you have to kind of have a super thin body. 
Uh, you're going to want to have a little bit of size to the body. Think reverse carrot, if you will, for shape. Uh, I do tend by habit. I learned to tie trout flies in the beginning from Charlie Craven. So by habit, I do start with less dubbing and build up. It's also more durable because that dubbing will lay onto each other and into itself versus just one big rope which would fight itself at the end of the day and come unraveled. So I'm going to lay down one thin base as to where I want my dubbing to go. And this is a great visual here. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to stop with about a scissors width, right? That's probably three mil of distance here. Because in this little space up here, we're going to tie in some rubber legs, uh, some peacock sword, and then build our head. And if we start creeping too close to those eyes, we're just going to end up cramming those materials in, in very little space, and it's just not going to balance itself well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back and we're going to build our taper to where we're happy with it. And once we get that reverse taper kind of kicking up front, what we can do is make sure that we've got a good visual on this fly. Now this fly is really, really buggy, and I think this is why. Um, the bushy tail, the hackle feathers, I think lend to the back end of this being supernatural and buggy versus having such a bright orange head. Um, nobody can explain why we do the things we do with carp flies. My hipster doofus doesn't have too many real things about it. Um, but this hackle feather with the antron and the tail work really, really well together. Uh, you're gonna get four, maybe, oh, I got five. Five turns, we're gonna capture that. I go on both sides of the hackle feather twice. I'm gonna go in, clip that out. It's gonna fall strategically in front of me perfectly. So when I get to this point here, I love the way those that, that feather laid down. If you have anyone up in your chili, right in this area, trim them out so you've got room. Don't worry, that these feathers here are gonna help support your peacock hurl or sword. And on the back side, if you have anyone kind of up on that back side of the head, you can trim a few of those out. But for the most part, if you kind of keep true to where your antron is, you can usually stop that feather and keep everything nice and clean. So here's where Lance took this to another level. Um, he used peacock sword. And man, oh man, does peacock look good in the water. It just does. So peacock sword is a little different than peacock hurl. It's a different part of the feather, and as you can see, the iridescence is through the roof on this. Just super, super pretty, super bright. And when the sun hits this at different ways, so this falls, this fly is falling, it just rotates a little bit. You're gonna get these different blues and greens. Super fishy stuff. So what we're gonna do here is basically tie this just, just above the hook point. We don't want it to be riding over. Uh, and we don't want it underneath to where it kind of just falls. We want this just at the top to occupy that space to where we don't have a hook point showing all the time. So here's what I usually do. I pinch my fingers and I hold my material in this hand and I try and line the crevice of my fingers up with the hook point so I can kind of keep things centered because I know my hook point is centered. So if that's my anchor, I know that I can put position things in front of where I feel that hook point, and I'm gonna be exactly where I wanna be. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, there we go, all right. All right, now we're gonna tie in some rubber legs. So I think that it's, it's pretty reasonable to say that rubber legs are gonna be a dealer's choice, however, whatever you have at hand, right? Maybe it's 10 o'clock at night. You can't get to Angler's All right now to get rubber legs. And you have to kind of use what you have. So I get it. However, what Lance is using are the green and pumpkin silly legs, right? It's just a tiny bit of green flash. I think they work well with the hurl. And tie them in. I just take one strand, cut it in half, and just go to the middle. You're not gonna need all that length. We will be trimming these off. So I'm gonna keep this just to the inside of my hurl. And then I'm gonna go ahead and wrap these around and grab those and do the same thing on that side. Now, technique alone is gonna force you 
to have these tie this leg because of thread tension and because the vise being there, we're gonna to wanna to move our hand and the, and, and the legs out, and it's gonna force you to tie them in a little farther on the side of the hook shank. So make sure that you line them up and you're both going where they want to be. What these legs are end up gonna end up be, being are more stabilizers than anything else. So when this fly falls, you're gonna have two legs stabilizing it as it eases its way down. So one of the little tricks I like to do is I like to make sure that as I tie back from the behind the eyes, forward that I'm grabbing the legs and tying them in together. So when my thread point, my tie-in stops, when I go back here against these legs, it's at the same point. That way I'll have one leg tied in here and one leg tied in farther behind it. So if I can keep those moments, those tie-in moments the same with those legs, then I improve my odds of those staying balanced and stabilizing the way they should. And then pull them back. And you wanna trim these just past the body of uh, your uh, past the dubbed body. So you can go longer and always trim down. If you trim them too short, well, that's gonna be how long they are. I like to go in, keep my scissors straight, right behind where I need to cut them, and go ahead and cut, and then I can always come in and make any minor adjustments that seem to be a little wonky on that cut, like that one there. So there's our stabilizers. Now we get to dub the head finish and fish this bad mofo. So we're gonna go to some Flow Orange Antron. And I do believe that using the Antron, just a great choice, being a synthetic that sheds water, doesn't really wanna absorb water in general, is just a good material to pick here. It's not hard to, to keep this in control uh, with tying, uh, and it's gonna be pretty durable in the field. So building ahead, again, you can go with a, a larger rope but I like to ease my way into building these things. Uh, the dubbing digs into itself way, way more durable. Uh, you'll see here that I'm gonna pull that dubbing to kind of get that inconsistency out of there. If that happens, and this starts coming off, just wet your finger and give it the old okie doke and it's back in line for you and it'll, it'll behave. So the more I like, I almost think of it as painting with thread. <laughs> Nice, easy strokes. We're just gonna make a mountain here. We're gonna paint some trees and a lake. No, we're gonna paint an Egan's headstand. And what I like to do is by having just little dubbing ropes rather than a big one, I have way more control as to A, where the dubbing goes, and B, how much of it. Now here's the, I'm not gonna try and sugarcoat it. It takes a little longer because you have to use several coats, but by going around several times, you've got a really, really strong head because all that dubbing works itself into each other. So I got, I got something poking through right here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna cover it up. This is also an advantage to going with minimal dubbing to build your head is that I didn't overbuild or build up to which I can't undo. That makes sense? Not much I say makes sense. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna try and make these wraps cover up that little bit of peacock curl that's poking through and then I can tighten that up. I'm gonna pull the rest off, I don't need that. Don't be afraid to self-edit. When you tie flies, it's important. All right, now this head can always be built much, much bigger. But you wanna always be careful if you start adding too much dubbing to the front of the head. This is a very, very nice balanced fly, so dubbing is weight. If you start adding too much, you can take away from what's gonna happen uh, balance-wise in the front of that. So I do tend to keep it right where I can see the dubbing is just under the crest of those bead chains and not over. Pretty consistent here, about an inch of uh, zap, and we're gonna wrap that down and then do some uh, whip finishes over the top of that zap. And that does a couple things for us. One, uh, the zap isn't on the thread that's actually showing. Uh, it's actually underneath, so you don't have zap hanging out. And then two, if this thread wrap, or I'm sorry, this whip ever broke free or got a hit with something sharp and started unraveling, it has to go through two whip finishes and then get to some zap that's been pretty much wrapped around. And I've, un I've cut these and undone them and it takes a razor blade to do that. So um, very, very strong and durable and well built uh, head on that for sure. So this is Egan's headstand. It is just a super, super soft landing, slow sinking fly. 
that is buggier than it does appear. When it gets wet, uh, it looks just spectacular. Uh, so yeah, tie some of these up and, and get out there. This is a great fly to kind of help with proportion. You're gonna get a lot of visual cues that you'll have in the process when you go through this fly. Uh, as soon as you dub that body up and stop where you're supposed to stop, you start seeing the proportions laid out in front of you to where you now you know where everything in the front of the fly is gonna go and where everything in that back 75% is gonna go. So just a great, great tie to have in your repertoire. Uh, Egan's headstand.